you need money for anything you want to do follow the money and not just my you know sort of ability to invest but also i saw that as an industry startups were you know having to explain what the issue was to investors who are investing in health but not women's health so they'd have to go in and explain what is pcos and why is it an issue and why do we have to fix it da, 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 da. and i thought well if women were investing they'd already know what the issue is and they understand that you need a solution hello money movers welcome to another episode of her money moves and today we are recording from New York City. Yes, NYC, the financial capital of the world. And we're recording from Rise Barclays, which is the home of FinTech. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to my guest, Delphine O'Rourke. She is a expert in health tech. She is an attorney, an advisor, a professor, and an investor. So she has so much valuable information to share with all of you. Thank you, Stacey. And yeah, this is the home of FinTech in New York City. So great energy and really excited to be on with you and with all of your viewers. Thank you. So tell us, how did you get started in your career? I was sort of one of those dorky people who wanted to be a lawyer even when I was little. So yeah, I sort of was one of those people and I you know, went to college and I studied, among other things, politics and international law. And then I went to law school and I was like, this is what I want to be doing. Yes. And Columbia Law, correct? Yes. Right here in New yep. York City? I went to Columbia in New York City and um, happy to talk about higher education and graduate school in a lot of different ways and how that can, I think, empower you, particularly as a woman. I found that being a lawyer, you can use that with a lot of other, you know, people say, well, you know, what if I don't want to be a lawyer? Well, there are a lot of, you know, retired lawyers or people who never even practiced, but the skill set and the analytical skills um, that you get from being a lawyer. No, well, especially reading over contracts. Well, exactly, right? exactly. That too can always be good for just your personal life. And so how long did you practice law? So I've been practicing for mm, a little over 20 years. I know. When you say it out loud, that sounds like an awfully long time. And then had the opportunity to, you know, we're looking, I was talking to the dean and said, you know, what are we doing around healthcare? Healthcare is the largest industry in the United States. It's the most regulated industry. It's actually more regulated than the financial services. So we're having a conversation with the law school and I said, well, what are we doing to train the next generation of lawyers in healthcare? Because it's changing so quickly mm -hmm. and there's also a big political piece in that you know the laws are changing and are often politically motivated so it's not an area of law where basically you know the law was established 50 years ago and you're just reinterpreting it so you know they said well what would you what do you think we should offer so i said what about the business of healthcare and the law and they said oh okay sounds like a good idea so i've been teaching that and now i'm teaching the first of this course um and the same thing i was like what are we doing around women's health which is my passion mm -hmm. and where i was hoping again to to share with new students so that students can keep the fight going around uh healthcare and reproductive rights after dobbs so that's how it sort of evolved but what i've ever thought that i would be teaching no way and that's definitely a theme of you know, you never know what you're going to be doing and, and follow the opportunities. How did you get into um, the women's health tech and, and reproductive rights and, you know, being the expert that you're in now? It gets back to that opening the door is where are there opportunities? What are unmet needs in healthcare? And came out of you know my experience it was working for a large health system and i said where where is there an opportunity for innovation where do we need innovation mm -hmm. you know and over and over i kept on coming back to women's health what are we doing in women's health that's different than we were doing five years ago and i say women's health broadly in that it's you know diseases, conditions that only impact, you know, people who were born female, as well as conditions and diseases that disproportionately impact women, like autoimmune diseases, or conditions that present differently in women, you know, heart attacks, for example, where we all know what the symptoms are for men, but not for women. And I think, where is there an opportunity to have an impact and really when we were talking about sort of like what's your why or your north star is mm -hmm. where is there an opportunity in healthcare with the tools that i have 
to make a difference and to, you know, my thing is, how do I reduce suffering? How do I do, you know, preventable deaths? And that to me, you know, combination of a highly regulated area, which is my legal strong suit, my always my passion for, for gender equity. It's like, maybe I can really add value in this area. And why the tech piece, because, you know, we need, we're seeing tech in all other areas. Why are we not seeing it in, in women's health. And then in 2016, you have Ida Tin, who is the founder of Clue, who coins this term, femtech, which is, you know, shorthand way to, to describe, you know, part of this industry, but really saying, where do we see a need for innovation? And it's not a, just a nice to have, but a real need for innovation. And, you know, maternal health is just part of the conversation. When you see the statistics in the United States, we have, we're 65th among developed countries in our maternal health outcomes. We're one of the most dangerous wow. developed countries to give birth in. Why are we not progressing? We're actually, our outcomes are actually worse. So why aren't we bringing technology and the latest that are helping all these other industries? Why aren't we bringing it to women's health? Why aren't we tackling these really difficult and important issues in the way that we're, we're tackling financial services or other areas? Mm -hmm. So that's how I got into women's health. I was like, there's a need and hopefully I have skills that can help with that solution. So tell us about some of the things you've been doing to help solve this. So, you know, we talked about this, I believe everybody has different levers. So what can you do? We can vote, we can write to our congressperson. That's how I got into investing. I said, okay, you know, I can give legal advice. I serve on boards. Well, you need money for anything you want to do, follow the money. And not just my, you know, sort of ability to invest, but also I saw that as an industry startups or you know, having to explain what the issue was to investors who are investing in health, but not women's health. Mm -hmm. So they'd have to go in and explain what is PCOS and why is it an issue and why do we have to fix it, da, 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 da. And I thought, well, if women were investing, they'd already know what the issue is and they understand that you need a solution. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, and that's one of the reasons I'm a lead partner with Portfolia, one of the really exciting things I think about Portfolia is that it's, I call it sort of learning how to flex your investor muscle, is that you can start investing at a much lower level. And I appreciate that for a lot of people, they don't even, you know, they don't have, that's not even an opportunity, um, but a much lower threshold than a lot of other funds. Right. And, and it's it, so funny over dinner that we discovered that we're both investors in portfolio. It's like I such know. A small world. And in completely different areas, but that's why we're aligned. We're saying, how can A, we bring solutions to market, to solutions, whether it's in ag and food or, or, or women's health? And then how can we have more and more women for themselves? Because women were leaving money on the table by not investing and having our money um, work for us mm -hmm. in the same way that men do. The data supports that. We, you know, we sort of put our money in savings. More women say, I'm comfortable being an investor. And I'm going to make more money for myself and also have an impact um, on society, you know, and great returns because women's health is a great place to invest. That's right. I mean, we all, 51% of the population it, that it impacts. 51%. And there's also a great thing when people say, oh, it's been underfunded, it's been ignored. Well, yeah, that's the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I mean, in an area that's, you're not, you know, you're not going to be able to invest enough in Microsoft to really make a difference, you know, but you can invest in some, you know, early stage companies that are working on, you know, everything from mental health to osteoporosis to early detection of ovarian cancer and really have an impact. Particularly with COVID, I talked to a lot of women who were saying, I want to have more purpose in my life. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you could invest in a solution, an early detection screening for cervical cancer, and it's the first one. That's impact. I mean, that gives me goosebumps. Like, you know what I mean? Yes. Like, that's impact. You're going to save lives, even if you're an accountant. Mm hmm which, you know, so that's how I got into women's health. There's a need. And the more I got into right. it, I was like blown so, away by the need. And you don't have to be a doctor. No. And you don't have to be a financial expert and investment banker to invest. No. And then you can also, you know, there are funds um, that are run by people who are experts. And you can also say, okay, I know you're really smart. I know you understand this industry. 
I have my day job and I'm not going to be monitoring all the companies, but I'm going to invest in you and I trust you to get the highest return on my money or invest in companies that are aligned with with my, you know, vision and and values. And you know, also as, you know, millennial generation is looking at what they're going to invest in, there's much more focus on what is the impact yes, yeah. of of your money. And when people say oh, women's health is niche, there are 4 billion women. That's a lot. That's a big market. You know, so whatever it is you're doing, and when I hear, oh, it's saturated, go talk to a woman and ask her if it's saturated, <laughs> you know? Uh, there's nothing that's saturated, no. right? Yeah. I got that recently. Well, isn't breast cancer saturated? I'm like, as long as women are still dying, dying of suffering. breast cancer, mm-hmm. it's not saturated. What connected you so passionately to women's health besides the fact of you being this extraordinary woman what's that connection where it's more than just a job because i believe that if you have that passion when it's hard when you're told no Mm -hmm. when you know another person you know investor whoever says that's not an issue you know incontinence that's not an issue well one in three women leak Incontinence is an issue, you know, mm-hmm. is to keep that going and, and having having that fire. But I bet if it was a man who was having that same issue, <laughs> it would be resolved like that. And they would be investing a lot of money into it to, to come up with a solution, I'm sure, right? Well, it's like, you know, uterine fibroids. 82% of, of women who identify as Black have uterine fibroids. That okay. much? Yeah. Wow. Again. If it was a you know a white male issue, we'd have some money going to that research. Mm-hmm. So it was really that combination. All of a sudden, it just clicked. I was like, wait a second. I'm all. I've always been focused in the legal profession on equity. I'm a lawyer in a highly regulated area in healthcare. Why didn't I think of this sooner? Mm-hmm. You know, it was, and I think part of it is this revelation of like, wow, we're really not doing much. I assume like, oh, we're focusing on all areas in healthcare, aren't we? Everybody's, you know, no, actually we're not doing all that much or what we should be doing. And the other piece is we are taught socialized, you know, people who study these things know much better than I do. Why? To accept less. So it's, oh, that's a lifestyle. Well, no, actually, you know, having pain and no anesthesia while an IUD is inserted, that's not a lifestyle choice, you know? So this sort of constant of like, you should be able to tolerate that, like, you know, where we wouldn't do that in other areas. And, and that was another big driver. It's, this is unnecessary suffering. We have the technology. Why isn't this moving? Yeah, and, and talking about it more, right? Some of the things that one out of four, one out of eight, one out of six, but we don't have a lot of conversations about it. I know Oprah is having, she's been having a campaign around, for example, menopause and how it's like been so taboo, but really it's something that every woman is going to go through at some point in their life and we need to get be educated about it and be prepared for what types of symptoms that we may experience. I posted on LinkedIn year of menopause and I got these like, you know, te- like DM, like direct message back. Like, what are you talking about? Like, why did you put that on LinkedIn? That's professional. And why are you saying it's the year of menopause? So it's like every woman, as you say, will go through menopause either medically induced or naturally unless she dies of something else. So when you talk about your, your, your market, and then I started really looking at data on how many women in the workplace because if you, unless you show an impact, an economic impact, it's often hard to see movement. Mm-hmm. So when you start saying, okay, 20% of the American workforce is in one of the three stages of menopause. So peri, menopause, postmenopause. Then you can start, it's like, whoa, employers are going to pay attention to that. What's the economic impact of ignoring menopause? whether it's absenteeism, whether it's performance, whether it's women just saying, you know what, there are 32 plus symptoms in menopause. I have eight of them and I just, if I have the choice, I'm not gonna work anymore. Um, And that's where I was like, this is, this really needs to be pushed. It's sort of one of those silent things, the impact on the economy, the impact on women staying in the workforce. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's sort of one of my also big drivers is how do we get senior women to stay? 
um, in legal profession, it's a big issue, um, and saying, okay, what are these silent things that nobody's talking about but are impacting women? And menopause is, first of all, we should change the name because right. it's inaccurate. It starts with men. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's, and it's, you know, and that's, but to your point, starting to talk about it. You know, compared to fertility, you know, people come in now and they're like, hi, do you offer fertility benefits? Do you pay for IVF? Like 15 years ago, if you'd gone in for a job interview in most corporate America and asked if they covered IVF, first of all, they wouldn't have known what IVF was. Mm -hmm. And then they, it would have been like, can you believe what they just asked? Well, I still can't believe how expensive it is to freeze our own eggs. And of course, when you're in your 20s, I mean, you have no idea because you are, you know, busy trying to get your life together and figure every, everything out, but you definitely don't have $20,000 or $30,000 to freeze your egg, right? It's not until later on in life that you then maybe discover. So I, that in itself is just such a, a travesty. It, that's a great point. And when we get to its reimbursement, health cares, you know, or when we have all these conversations, I see politicians talking about healthcare. It's you know a lot of it comes down to what's being reimbursed by government programs. The majority of Americans are their insurance is paid for by a government program, whether it's Medicaid or Medicare or Medicare Advantage or Tricare. They don't pay for fertility, so mm. automatically you have a big divide between people who can pay twenty thousand dollars that's after taxes right. and people who can't. You know that's a societal impact um, that you know we don't we don't discuss, and you know European countries are trying to figure out that balance, um, and we're generally a little bit behind, if not a lot behind. But that's a that's a great point. Mm -hmm. So you know we like to talk about innovation and um, what are some of the femtech or women's health tech startups that you're really excited about? Like what is some of the innovation that you see that's going to change? things for us in the future? Great question. And I think one is what you just talked about. How do you pay? Mm -hmm. You can't go to a bank and say, I'd like to take a loan to freeze my eggs or to have IVF or that's where there's an opportunity for FinTech. Say mm -hmm. what? There's this whole healthcare industry, whether it's deductibles or co-pays or there's no insurance product for women so there are interesting companies that are sort of early stage in that and saying how can you finance your own health differently you know there's a company that's looking at um that's looking at how can you have your health care actually be an asset so right now, you know, your personal health information, your doctor has it, maybe, you know, some other third parties have it. You don't benefit from that. So what if you, you know, agreed to share some of your health information? It wasn't identified as Stacy. It was female between the ages of X and Y who I'm making up a condition, um, who has hypertension. Okay. And when a pharmacy company or pharmaceutical company wanted to do a clinical trial, they'd say, oh, well, we really need women during that in that age group who live in Houston. And you got a message said, you could license your information for $15,000. Are you interested? So, you know, interesting companies, there's a company called Dragonfly that's doing that, you know, so you can actually monetize it as, as your asset. Um, I'm very interested in early detection, preventive care. Mm -hmm. You know, if we really want to shift our healthcare system and our costs, we need to prevent. We need to prevent. And there are a lot of reasons why people don't, and particularly women, and particularly with COVID, and when you have to pay for deductibles. So anything that allows you to test, maybe it's at home, and maybe it's not 100% as effective, but maybe it's 95%, and that's better than zero. But more and more that you can do early on well, at and, home. And we're so busy and we often put ourselves in our own health last. Exactly. That we're like, oh, we don't have time to go to the doctor. I don't have time I to go to the doctor. I, I literally was sick for two months, two or three months coughing. But it was like, how can I actually find time to go and sit in a doctor's office and waiting room? I mean, that's another issue right there. But it's just it's just hard to find time. And we do often put ourselves last. And we're calling that you know, the concept of time poverty. 
Mm. And there's time poverty is a major obstacle to care for men and women. That can be, I don't have time. Or when I get out of my shift at nine o'clock at night, who am I going to go see? There are no mental health providers or I have to drive two hours to the nearest health care. So in that space of reducing time poverty, you know, 65% of men and women in the U.S. are at least are two years behind in their cancer screening. Okay. And as we know, early detection, early detection. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? All of the solutions that are bringing care where it's convenient. So getting back to your, you know, original question is it's bringing care to people. You know, it's moving, shifting that from you have to come to the hospital. Yeah, for certain things, you have to come to the hospital. You know, if you're having a hip replacement, I'm not advocating that you do it at home. Um, but <laughs> what we're, and it's not replacing. It's people aren't doing it now. So what can we do to get those moms health uh, testing that they need or somebody who's a senior and not as mobile and can't drive for their annual test? Mm -hmm. How can, you know, reach them? Maternal health, I already mentioned, just because it's a crisis in the United States and where we have fewer and fewer doctors who want to do OB. So you have fewer doctors, moms who are sicker and sicker, because they're not getting the care that they need. So that's just exacerbated. So, you know, really interesting solutions around how do you, again, monitor along the way. Menopause is a huge one. And there's some, you know, starting solutions, just awareness. I mean, talk to most women and say, how many symptoms are there roughly of menopause? Name five, name 10. I just did a presentation for a consulting company on the inter, they asked me to speak on the interplay between menopause and the workplace. And, you know, so I was speaking, it was a Zoom, and you know how people can put things in the chat room? Right. And it was like, I never knew. I never knew. I have that. I never knew. It was menopause. Like that, you know, a public, you know, awareness, awareness, awareness will reduce pain and suffering for men and women on a lot of different topics. What were some of those symptoms that um, people don't know about? Hair falling out, dry nails, um, you know, brain fog, um, which you know, combined with um, you know, vaginal dryness. I mean, you sort of, sort of like dryness everywhere. Um, and then, you know, and then solutions. You know, people know about hot flashes and sort of make jokes about hot flashes. But that's just one of, of many symptoms. Um, depression is is significant for some women. Again, every person experiences differently. Mm -hmm. um, but the stories of, it took me six years to realize this was menopause. You know, I went to a neurosurgeon. I went to a this. I went to a that. Because the primary care physicians aren't necessarily trained. There are only about 1,000, it's 1,000, 1,500 physicians who are specifically trained in menopause in the country. Wow, I had no idea that number was so low. So, you know, even if you could do a self-diagnosis, it might not be 100%, but that might lead you in the right direction to, again, I get back to that theme of reduce the pain and suffering of seven years thinking, oh my God, I might have a brain tumor, mm -hmm. or why am I depressed? I have no, quote, reason to be depressed, or, you know, why am I losing a third of my hair and I don't understand why? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's that that we can fix that. You know, as a country, we're really good at the, you know, breakthrough novel. What about just fixing that? You know, make people aware of their bodies and what the symptoms can be. You know, women of color, these are the things that you're going to be, that you're going to experience differently. You know, Native Alaskans, these are things to think about because, you know, the data supports that you're going to experience them differently, whatever it is so that we have more awareness and then control of our own health. You know, and that gets to the reproductive. It's controlling our own bodies, understanding our own bodies and, and having control over them. Yes, wow, well, thank you. I always like to end the show with asking about how are you building for the future? Like, what are you dreaming bigger about? So my big dream is that we need to have a platform where we can mobilize. In women's health, there's a lot of conversation, which is great. Before there was no conversation. Now we have conversation. And then it's like, okay, what's the action? So action you can invest, we've talked about it. 
is I think we could really, there's an opportunity around the political process to mobilize in a different way. So for example, there was a proposal for, during COVID uh, for certain menopause services, you didn't have to pay a copay. And for a lot of people, $20 really makes a difference, mm -hmm. okay? So there's a proposal to put the copay back, okay? You might say, well, that's not that big of a deal. For a lot of women, that's a big deal. So to be able to say, let's mobilize. And if you get 100,000 voices, if you get 10,000 emails, if you get 1,000 emails saying, don't do this, that's how we also impact. You know, and I think Dobbs really brought that home. Change the legislation, whether whichever side of the arguments you are on, you have the power to influence legislation. And let's be proactive. And if we say, you know what, a priority is more research for uterine fibroids, well, send 1,000 emails, 10,000 emails to congressional representatives who probably don't even know it's an issue and say, this is the bill that we propose and we suggest that you support it. And that's what I'm trying to figure out is how do we create that mobilization around issues that are important, but not like who really wants to focus on reimbursement for Medicare menopause copays? I mean, talk about getting people to snooze, you know, you're like, this is not a sexy topic, but those topics matter. So it's that political mobilization. And when I say political, it's also proposed legislation. You know, we do it. I've done it in in in, in Pennsylvania area. We said this is the legislation we propose around women on boards with an organization. We said we think this would be really good. Why don't you think about it? Okay, I mean that happens all the time. You know, I say it's going to be my it's my AARP of women's health. If politicians are going to touch AARP and think AARP is going to be upset, they pause. Oh yeah. <laughs> so imagine if there was like the AARP of women's health, where they were like, oh, before we cut this, are they going to be upset? And if there's a doubt, then we're part of the conversation and the dialogue. So that's my next dream big. Yeah, that's that's powerful. If we all band together. Thank you so much for Thank being you. with us today Thank and sharing you. your expertise. And oh my gosh, let's really band together so that we can make some change and ensure that our our needs, these are basic needs in healthcare are met. And thank you for, you know, for your, your giving a voice and, and women in the financial, follow the money, you know, with money gives power. So thank you. Thank you, Delphine.